This morning, uh, before we look at Scripture, I want to walk us through um, a handful of things and, and uh, kind of touch base on them briefly. And so I uh, just want to remind you that on the back of that bulletin that you have, there's a space for you to jot notes or uh, there's a pen or uh, pencil there in front of you in, in our holders. And uh, you might just want to jot something down. It's not that I have all these marvelous things to say. That's not it. But uh, maybe something I share um, might stir you on to even a greater thought, and you might want to write that down. And so I um, want you to maybe have that ready and uh, something you can take with. And, of course, um, you know, maybe you need to write something down, obviously, for someone else because, you know, you don't struggle at all. It's the people around you. Um, that was sarcasm, by the way. You, it's okay to laugh and, you know, chuckle a little bit. Um, and uh, I want to share with you, um, and it not, this is not an extensive list or a totally conclusive list, but I want to share with you five things that are um, kind of relationship killers. Um, and I want to talk initially about this in the way that we communicate with um, important people in our life, those who we're supposed to be closer with and friends, and, and certainly even making new friends and you know, opening up our life to them, and hopefully in turn they do the same. And uh, we both benefit from that, and ultimately for the Lord to do a work in and through us and in others. And so... Um, I'm going to start a little bit on the human level here with these five points, and then we're going to take those, keep those five things in mind, and then transfer those to our relationship and our communication with the Lord, and see if maybe there's some things on this relationship killer list that we kind of fall into in our human relationships, and that they might have a hint of those in our uh, relationship with the Lord. And we need to maybe pay attention to that and then take a look at that this morning. And so I'm going to share with you uh, quickly uh, five things that are um, relationship killers in our life. And, and it's not just marriage. Uh, it can be parenting and uh, it can be close friends, uh, relationships with people within the body, um, and even, uh, you know, friends that we have that probably are a little closer to us, maybe than some other acquaintances. So uh, let's start with this. Um, because this, you know, there are people that, you know, we're supposed to build a bond with and love, and they love us back, and we want to be close to them. We want them to be close to us. And, you know, um, I want you to consider this, that sometimes in those relationships over time, we can fall into almost giving the impression that we are um, giving social platitudes to them, um, where they should feel probably a little closer and a little more uh, special to us, and yet we sometimes give a social platitude. Let, social platitude, let me put it to you this way. Um, it would be, for example, um, you're walking down the aisle, whether it's here at Walmart or somewhere else, uh, uh, someplace, and there a person's walking towards you. You happen to glance, they glance, you catch eye, and you look at each other, and of course the social platitude thing to do is to kind of nod, maybe smile, and say hello or how you doing. Um, and that's a social platitude. It's kind of what we do, okay? It's called being nice or polite or kind of what is expected of you, not that it's a written rule, and we do that. Well, for those who are closer to us, um, hopefully we don't settle into social platitudes, and sometimes we do it this way. For example, um, uh, I can walk into the house, and my wife is there, and I can ask um, that kind of question. And it, the question is, how was your day? And, I mean, it's not like it's a bad question. It's just for someone who's closer to us, there's got to be more than how was your day. Because it really implies a one-word answer, especially if you're asking a man. How was your day? Good. 
Same. It's all right. That's three words, but, you know, we're expanding as men. It was all right. Um, you know, you kind of get the ugh or the, the growl or the, well, it's all right, you know, whatever. Um, it's not a real engaging question, question, and we can settle into that. And that is kind of the only question we kind of throw out there. And yet this is a person that's closer to us. Uh, it can be a child coming home from school or uh, coming home from being out with friends, and we go, did you have a good time? I mean, it's okay, but please tell me that that is not, you know, we ask those kind of questions to strangers and just in polite social platitudes. And so one of the relationship killers is when we, over time, settle into social platitude questions or conversation, which is not deep. You know, something more engaging to someone who's near us might be when they come in and you can say, how was your day? And then the follow-up question or something else for a meaningful relationship is you might ask, uh, what made you laugh today? What made you smile today? And it may sound like a strange question if you're not used to really engaging with someone important in your life. And you can come up with your own questions. But when you come up with a question that's, uh, for example, you know, what made you smile today, um, it says something more than how was your day. It was, it was I'm interested in your well-being and how you feel, and I want you to recall something that happened in your day that you can share with me because I'm interested and I care about you. You see, a question like that says all of that. And we don't sit there and process it in the front hall when we come in and go, oh, gee, they care about me and they want to know, you know. It's not like we do that. It's we hear this question and we begin to come up with our answer from the day and yet we feel all of this interest and care and sharing and something that's someone close that engages relationship instead of, how was your day? That could be a real relationship killer over time because we settle into social platitudes with people who are important to us or should be important to us. Second thing. Um, not stating the obvious. Um, this can be another killer. We think, you know, ah, why state the obvious? Nah, they already know. It's kind of the, I told you I loved you at the wedding. If I change my mind, I will let you know, kind of like the excuse that, you know, I don't have to keep telling you the obvious. I want you to know that we should state the obvious. Um, it should go beyond that, but certainly stating the obvious is good. It's not like you didn't tell them you love them one day and all of a sudden they go, gee, you know, I wonder if they love me. You know, it's not that they're going to fall into this, but it's this reassurance, it's this engaging, it's this connection. Listen, if she's running 10 minutes late and you are in the vehicle and she comes out the front door, of course, you get out of the car and go open the door for her. I mean, we, of course we know that. And she gets in the car and you get in. Um, it's probably stating the obvious that she needs to hear. Honey, you look great and you're worth waiting for. Still. <laughs> no, you don't have to add the still part. <laughs> but state the obvious. She's put some effort into this, and she's beautiful, and she matters to you. State the obvious. I love you. You look nice. I'm happy to be seen with you. Because she obviously knows that already, that it's a privilege for you to be with her. Just kind of helping you out here. Um, it's okay to state the obvious. Um, your child comes home with an A. It's obvious that they did well, then you should state it. When we don't state the obvious, it becomes like there's a disconnect, we're not paying attention, and now the bond is eroding over time. So keep in mind that uh, we should ask unique and personal questions like, 
you know, what made you smile today? What made you laugh today? More than how, you know, how you doing? <laughs> how was your day? Um, those are pretty platonic. And uh, we should also state the obvious things, like I love you. If we don't do those things, um, they become over time relationship killers. Third thing that I want to mention, um, not communicating what is problematic for you maybe in the relationship. What isn't going real great for you? There's something that uh, is bothering you. And I know that that's hard to do, and part of that has to do with personalities and your natural makeup and tendencies to maybe avoid conflict or um, the other person or you, you get defensive right away, and all of this tainted maybe the way we grew up, a little bit of personality, our history, etc. But if we just avoid that, it will erode the relationship. What will help is if we discuss, and it's not something we got to do and should do every day. But it's something that as we maneuver through awkward and difficult conversations about disappointment or hurt or something problematic in the relationship, it, this is what it produces, is it, when we deal with it healthy and in, a, in the right frame of mind. Um, those are, of course, conditions um, that we need to, you know, have a sense of well-being and all of this. But um, in that relationship, when we do that and we maneuver through these discussions, after the fact, it actually builds more trust. In other words, I was vulnerable, I was honest, I was open, you heard me, I listened back, and through this, I've learned that we're still together, and now there's more trust that's been gained between the two of us. It's one of the reasons that in uh, when I meet with a couple who is... Um, about to get married, and uh, they want me to officiate, or they ask me to do the, they call it pre-marriage counseling, I just call it pre-marriage coaching, and where we sit together, we talk a little bit, we get to know each other some more, and uh, I may ask some, uh, you know, trigger questions, and if it shows up that this is something we should talk about a little further, then I take time and do that, and then I give homework and different things through the different sessions. We One of the things that I give them to do as homework is this. Because it involves them being honest and vulnerable and open so that on the other side of this conversation that they have, that they will build a bond of trust. And this is the homework assignment. That they would take time and personally do an inventory of their own history. Now, obviously, for them to get to that point in a relationship that they want to get married, they have shared some of their history, some of their background, some of their culture, some of their uh, uh, hurts and the way they grew up and some things they accomplished and some disappointments and all of that. But the homework is I want you to be thorough and I want you to look at your life and consider anything in your past that you would consider to be a secret. Because it's a wonderful thing to be able to walk into the church on your wedding day, step up on the altar, make a vow, and hear a vow back in the presence of God and witnesses, and know in the depths of your heart that you don't have any deep, dark secrets from them. So I have them go through this exercise and encourage them to do this. And by the way, I don't encourage them to do it the night before the ceremony. Um, this is, you know, weeks, months in advance. And it may not always be one conversation. Something else may occur to them a few days later. But I, I just say, listen, you, you can introduce it this way. I want to share something with you from my background, from my past. And it's very personal. And... Um, Pastor Randy said, you can always throw that in there if you want, that this is part of our homework. And because I love you and we're going to get married and I want us to continue to trust one another, I want to share this with you. Or I don't want to, but I need to because you need to know. And it might be something that you've already dealt with, it's been resolved, it, it doesn't affect you anymore, but... If it was something that came up somehow, some way, down the road after you're married, and they go, whoa, 
I never knew that. That was kind of an important thing. Not that it would have changed my mind about marrying you necessarily. It's just, why wouldn't you have told me, don't you trust me? And then it starts this. Hmm, what else haven't they told me? Now, this begins to happen, and they're married. So the beauty is that if we can share those things and do the homework and have those difficult, maybe awkward, maybe embarrassing, very emotional conversation, is that on the other side of that, it has built a trust. Because now I know we're still together. You love me. You have distributed a grace and a mercy to me. You have heard me out, and everything's good. At the time, it was uncomfortable. Now, keep in mind, if you're the one who's going to do this homework, by the way, this is a little side note, if you decide to do this, remember, though it might be way in your past, they're hearing it for the first time. So give them a little latitude in dealing with this, because for them, though they're hearing it for the first time, and it happened way back in your past, they, it, to them, it almost feels like it just happened yesterday. So give them a little time. Allow them to ask questions. Because the, the goal is this, that we understand, we know, and we build trust. If we aren't willing to talk about problematic things or potential problematic things in our relationship, I want you to know that the trust will not continue to build and it erodes over time and settles in at a low level and it becomes a relationship killer. Especially if we're coupling some other things with it, like never asking really engaging, personal, unique questions, or if we're not stating the obvious things. I don't care how long you've been together or been friends or uh, been married or how old your child is, and you still got to state the obvious. Let's look at a fourth thing. Um, when it comes to almost literally not speaking at all. I mean, the conversations basically are, you know, uh, what do you want to eat? How was your day? Good. And you maybe if it's a marriage context, you talk about the kids. If it's a friend thing, you, you know, talk about something that isn't real important. You know, you talk about the weather. Uh, not that the weather's not important, but, you know, um, you're not all farmers. And uh, so, basically not speaking at all. And these are people we're supposed to be close to. People that we're, have a mutual respect and a love and a bond and trust that we're supposed to grow and develop. If, if we're barely speaking at all, and it's just basically a business meeting, those are not the closest they're not the most personal. They aren't the ones who love you, work through things, they're for you. It's just a business meeting. You know? You want anything on the grocery list? It's a family business meeting. It's a friendship business meeting. You talk about the things that work, and then that's the extent of it. That's a relationship killer for relationships that we're supposed to have that are closer. Granted, those things need to be included, but they can't be the only thing that we talk about. Fifth and final thing. We sometimes hear the word communication, and we quickly think that it's about one person talking, one person listening. Then the other person talks, and then the other person listens. I want you to know that that is not really communication. Hear this. Let me finish. Those are the tools of communication to get us to the outcome we desire. And the outcome that we desire from this interaction, or the thing we call communicating, this talking and listening, is to supposed to produce understanding. I learned something early in marriage when uh, something would hurt or bother my wife. Um, and by the way, it wasn't always me. <laughs> something would happen and she wanted to talk and get it out. Well, because some of my nature is problem solving, okay? Um, it's, you know, part of what, you know, a lot of you have that gift and it operates uh, 
you know, pretty strongly in your life. I mean, part of that is what you do as a pastor. Um, so problem solving. Not that I'm the answer man or other problem solvers are always the answer people or answer woman, and we got all the, that's not it. It's just something that we do and we quickly, you know, default to that gifting. And so here we are, um, early marriage, and she's wanting to talk about something that's hurt her, bothered her, or went on, or a situation, or, you know, whatever. And um, I would listen, and then I would quickly <clears throat> give advice, <clears throat> counsel, because I listen to her, and I've got, here's step one, step two, step three, resolved, done, move on, let's go. And I'm sounding a little more harsh than what I really acted like. I'm just kind of giving you bullet points. And what I began to understand is that she didn't want counsel or advice. She wanted empathy. Not sympathy, empathy. That I would become acquainted with her feelings and with her thoughts so that I could gain understanding. Now, I know at some point, those of problem solvers in the room are saying, well, that's real nice, and that's peachy, and that's all sensitive and touchy-feely, because that's your darkened view of empathy, is you're thinking, but that doesn't resolve anything. Um, well, well, hold on. We will work to a resolve, and for sometimes that's a little bit longer process. But in the meantime, because my wife is smart enough, she's going to figure this out anyhow, right? Yes. The answer is Yes. Um, is that it was about understanding. Here's the deal. If I would, <clears throat> through this talking and listening process of what we call communication, if I just give counsel and advice, understand from then on, when she doesn't get empathy, or I don't get empathy, you don't understand me, then you know what? I'm not talking anymore. I'm not sharing anymore. This doesn't work out and you just want to give advice, or you just want to quickly give me the answer, or you want to interrupt and think you have it figured out, and then I ain't going to talk anymore. See? So understand that the talking and listening are tools to com come out on the other side so that we commune and have an understanding about one another. That brings relational life. So when you talk about communicating, it's not just talking and listening. Those are only the tools. We're looking for the outcome we want, which is empathy, which leads to an understanding. It doesn't mean just because you understand that you have to agree. It's that I'm showing myself to be interested in you, and I'm wanting to understand. And those of you in this room who say things, and we joke about it, uh, you know, um, especially in a marriage context, it's... She's a woman, I'll never understand her. The moment I think I understand her, she changes her mind. Listen, that's part of the understanding. Oh, be nice to me. And it's not that she always changes her mind, it's just that, you know what, along the way, maybe we as men, we haven't been real good at showing the empathy and the listening and the trying to understand. It's a relationship killer if we don't try to gain understanding through the talking and listening and engaging and how that person feels and how that person thinks. And I want you to know this, that this applies to relationship that you have with men. Okay? This isn't just a woman thing. It's a man thing. It's why some men can get together and say very few words because they already understand one another. It's true. I've had conversation just recently, and it happens regularly, um, a man uh, who I have reached out to who is um, not a believer at this point in his life, and he talked about some frustration he had and a relationship he had, and he didn't have to say much when I responded and said something of a situation and a role and relationship that I have in my life, and immediately he went, okay, I don't need to say any more about that. You get it, because there's an understanding. 
It's about understanding. That is the point of communicating, is that we grow in understanding. We do it through talking and listening. Now, as we talked about this on the human level, of five killers of human meaningful relationships, I want to read a scripture to you in Psalm 28. Because this can apply to our relationship with the Lord. Don't think for a moment that we can't settle into some of these things in our relationship, our communication with the Lord when we do it on a human level. Don't think that that relationship is immune to these things on our behalf. Listen to what uh, David writes here in Psalm 28. He says, To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Don't be deaf to me, and don't be silent to me. In other words, please listen when I call upon you, Lord. Listen to me. And he's saying this, I will listen to you, because he's saying, don't be silent. In other words, Lord, talk to me. Speak to me. I want to grow in my understanding of you. I want us to grow in our understanding of one another. Now, that sounds peculiar because we know the Lord knows everything. But remember, we're going to start practicing stating the obvious. Lord, if you are silent to me, and if you won't listen to me, look at this. I will be like one who goes down to the pit, down to Hades, down to hell, separate from you. In other words, if you and I don't talk, and you and I don't listen to each other, I am already lost. I haven't even entered eternity yet, and I am lost with no hope, no peace, no answer to come. I am doomed. If I don't know that you're listening and you don't talk to me, I'm, I'm, I'm done for. I've already entered hell in the rest of this life and then for eternity because I am away from you. I am apart from you. You have turned me away. There is no relationship, nothing meaningful. The psalmist writes it and says, I am asking you, Lord, to please hear me. And I am asking you to talk in return to me, that we can engage. Now listen, this is not just, uh, you know, um, hey Lord, I'm in trouble. I mean, that's, you know, all of our prayer. We have that prayer. Um, I'm in trouble. That's like, you know, feeling distant from your children and it kind of hurts and the only time they call you is when they want something. See, that's empathy. Empathy. Because if we look from a parent's view that our child isn't close to us, we don't have a great relationship, they, you know, they were at home, it was okay and all of that, but they moved out, they moved away, and they really don't communicate with me much, and we get disappointed by that, and then we get the feeling that the only time they call is um, you know, when they need something. And we feel bad about that. But look at this, the empathy part is... What how, is it possible that we do that with our Father in heaven? The thing that hurts us and that we are, don't like and that kind of irritates us and we kind of condemn the action of our child, are we yet doing the same thing with our Father in heaven? That's empathy. Lord, how do you feel about something? Oh, I get the picture. I'm only checking in with you when I need something, when I want something. Oh, if our child does that to us, now we understand how he feels, how he thinks. Yeah. See, that's empathy. See, the Lord, part of his holy nature is empathy. I mean, he's the one that sent his only begotten son, and Jesus took on human likeness, the scripture says, and so he became acquainted with this hard, difficult life. And dealing with broken humanity, he had to now learn how to seek his father, go to prayer, do things like this, the struggle, the temptations. Jesus was acquainted 
So when you talk to God, he has full empathy. It's part of his holy nature, his character, his virtue. He gets it. He understands. He is not a God who didn't come and we say, well, I'll tell you how it is down here, but you'll never understand it. Oh, he understands firsthand. You see, empathy. So when we look at our relationships and where they're problematic, we always need to consider, am I now doing the same thing in my relationship with the Lord? Maybe you are irritated by someone who's supposed to be close to you in life, and you know they're just asking the social platitude questions. And you feel distant, and it's hurt like, it hurts like they're not interested. Are we doing the same thing with the Lord? Are we just given social platitudes? Or are we asking engaging questions of him? And do we allow him to ask engaging questions to us? That moves us into a personal relationship. See, David writes, listen to me and talk to me. Let's turn that around because the, the opposite is true. And I don't want to play with Scripture here, but the opposite is true. Maybe it's not him who's being quiet, and maybe it's him who's not listening. What if it's me? What if he is saying to me, would you please hear me? And would you talk to me? I want us to grow in our understanding through this communication, talking, listening, to move to this understanding. I wonder if it's us who's not talking and who's not listening. I love the example of David, and we know the Holy Spirit put this in David's heart and life, to live this, feel this, and write this to us that we can gain from it. Lord, listen to me and talk to me Because if you don't, I'm already doomed. Without a hope of redemption or being saved or delivered. But I wonder if maybe it's me. That I'm not the one that's talking with engaging questions. Unique questions. Probing questions personal questions of him, of myself. Maybe it's me who stops stating the obvious. I mean, it's why we do praise and worship and exalting him. We're stating the obvious, that he's awesome. (laughs) And all life is found in him. And he is great. And I'm broken. Stating the obvious. Maybe it's us who... We just kind of stop the whole communication. I mean, we go to church. We do some Christian things. We do our little daily devotional. But, you know, it's kind of like I did the business of the day, my spiritual business. I talked with him. I read a little bit and prayed for me and prayed for some other people, and I'm done. It's a business meeting. I don't know, when's the last time you've taken him for a walk? You've walked together. Did something like that together. That was outside of your regular spiritual discipline of the business meeting. Of reading and doing a little prayer. Maybe we're not the ones that are listening or talking. Maybe we're not speaking at all. It's kind of that passive-aggressive, you know, uh, No communication brings death to the relationship. I'm not acting out. I'm just being real passive about it, not intentional, and just letting it go. We do that on a human level. Are we doing that with the Lord? Maybe we're so interested in our own feelings and struggles that we have no empathy towards the Lord and what he's thinking and what he's feeling. Now he's looking at things. You see, we're supposed to talk and listen to produce what communicate, the tools of communication are supposed to bring, and that is greater understanding of who he is, who other people are in our life that are supposed to be close to us and that we're supposed to build a bond with and a trust with. What happens when communication ceases? 
I want you to stand with me, please, all over this room. Are there some relationship killers in your relationship with the Lord? Or are you getting personal and emptying out the secrets and the closets? Nothing to hide from him. I mean, he sees it anyhow, but you know, we still try to hide stuff. I mean, it's from the very beginning. You know, look at Adam and Eve. They know that God knows everything. And yet they tried to hide their sin. We still try to hide things. Maybe it's time for us to just be open and come clean and get real personal with the Lord and quit making him like he's a God out there somewhere. For those of us who are believers or Christians and we're trying to make him sound great and merciful and gracious and, you know, all that he is, and yet somewhere in our own life, we're having a little bit of an a unengaged relationship with him. If you're not feeling stirred or close to the Lord, or maybe it's been some time, maybe we need to look at the list and just say, man, there's some relationship killers that I've allowed to come in, and I need to get back to where David was at. Oh, Lord, please hear me. Don't turn a deaf ear to me. And please, don't be silent. Talk with me. Talk with me. We need to take care of that there. If, if on some human level some of these things apply, then, you know, put something in motion. Because here's the reality. For a relationship to exist and grow and build a bond, you, you've got to talk and you've got to listen so that you gain understanding. You've got to do it. As uncomfortable as that might be, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. Come out the other side and you're going to learn that you can trust. And you can love, and you can build a bond, and it can be really good. It makes relationships go better, I will just tell you that. But when these killers are in place, it is hard, and it is like a slow death, and frustration happens, and our disappointment, and, you know, we feel like we're not fulfilled and our eye will wander to something or someone else. If we got these killer things involved in our relationship with the Lord, we'll start looking. We'll start looking to someone or something else. You'll look to a recreation or a new this or a new that or whatever, all because this relationship is not in order. And we are all, we are all susceptible if we don't pay attention to these five things and come back to the basic of, God, I want to understand you more, so I need you to listen to me and I need you to talk to me. And I need to talk with you and I need to listen to 